going to begin this morning with the midterm elections and the latest developments in races across the country with just 20 days to go. With control of Congress hanging in the balance, President Biden is trying to make abortion rights the main focus of the campaign. He's telling voters that if they give Democrats control of the House and Senate, the first bill he'll send Congress will be one that codifies Roe into law. At the same time, early voting is already underway in more than a dozen states, with more states to follow, and we're already seeing massive turnout at the polls. In Georgia, they've already surpassed the number of votes cast in early voting in the 2018 midterm election. This morning, we're focusing on key races in Arizona and Florida, and we're looking ahead to early voting in North Carolina. We have full coverage of the midterms coming up. We're going to talk to NBC News correspondent Michelle Sindor in a moment. She has a look at the record number of black women running for office. And Shaquille Brewster has a recap of the Florida Senate debate. But let's begin with NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray, who joins us now with the latest on the midterms. Mark, good morning to you. So let's start with President Biden promising to codify Roe versus Wade if Democrats remain in control of Congress in the new year. A recent poll, though, shows the economy is on the minds of more Americans than abortion rights is. So is this the right strategy? And really, what's the president's message to voters as he tries to lay out his vision for after the midterms? Yeah, Joe, abortion rights has become a galvanizing issue for Democrats, and we saw that after the Supreme Court overturned the Roe versus Wade, a ruling that had existed for more than 50 years. And um, we saw that in polling in Kansas and other special elections where that issue really did fire up Democrats. And one way to actually look at what President Biden was doing yesterday in his remarks in Washington, D.C., was just to kind of reignite that flame a little bit and make the the point that if Democrats hold on to control of the U.S. House of Representatives and gain additional Senate seats, that he'll codify, that he will work and make it a priority to codify Roe versus Wade. Take a listen to his remarks, what he said yesterday. Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader of the House, has said that if they take control of the House, our work is, quote, far from done. That's why in these midterm elections are so critical to elect more Democratic senators to the United States Senate and more Democrats to keep control of the House of Representatives. Here's the promise I make to you and the American people. The first bill that I will send to the Congress will be to codify Roe v. Wade. And when Congress passes it, I'll sign it in January. Joe, you know, it is important to note that while the president was talking about abortion rights yesterday, it's not the only thing that he and Democrats are talking about today. He's going to be addressing energy prices from the White House and then later talking about the bipartisan infrastructure law. OK, so that's the national big picture. I want to turn to Arizona, the race for governor there. The GOP candidate, Carrie Lake, actually campaigned last night with former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who recently announced that she had left the Democratic Party, which maybe wasn't terribly surprising to most Democrats. But tell us about the state of this gubernatorial race and the significance of having a former Democrat on the campaign trail. Yeah, Joe, this is one of the most consequential gubernatorial races in the country. Of course, this takes place in Battleground, Arizona. It is also one in which Arizona's abortion laws are on the book. And it is a uh, it is a state in which, you know, because of its battleground nature, who is governor, who is secretary of state, who is attorney general really does matter. Uh, and Carrie Lake is someone who ended up denying the 2020 uh, presidential results. It's also notable that Tulsi Gabbard, who was campaigning with her, she was a Democrat who ran for president in the 2020 cycle. And it's not the first election denying Republican that she has uh, campaigned with. She also campaign with New Hampshire uh, Senate candidate Don Bulduck as well. And Mark, let's talk about the early voting so far in this election. I mean, in Georgia, more than 131,000 people cast their ballot on the first day of early voting there. That's nearly double what we saw in the 2018 midterms. What are these numbers telling us about the state of the election? Is this something we could expect in other races, say like North Carolina, which begins early voting tomorrow? We've just seen a really sea change in how people cast their votes, particularly in states that have a, a liberalized their voting, have allowed us a, a lot of weeks of early voting or very liberalized types of mail-in ballots. Uh, you know, Joe, when I first started covering politics 20 years ago, almost everyone ended up voting on Election Day. And if you couldn't make it on Election Day, you'd had to actually uh, mail in your ballot and go through a whole big process to be able to do that. Nowadays, people can actually uh, vote early 
And we're seeing a lot of Democrats, and usually more Democrats than Republicans, take advantage of this. Donald Trump uh, ended up kind of instructing Republicans to remain Election Day voters. And we see this big difference where a lot of Democrats end up casting early ballots. They cast uh, uh, mail-in ballots, and Republicans wait till Election Day. And as we're going to be watching the returns on Election Night, it's important to keep that in mind because some states end up releasing their mail-in ballots and early ballots first, and other ones actually uh, save that for the end. And so as all the results come in, we're going to see different batches just on how differently people vote. And that also includes in Georgia. Very important to prep our audience for what's going to happen on election night. Mark, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Now let's bring in NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster. He joins us from Palm Beach, Florida, after last night's Senate debate between Republican incumbent Marco Rubio and Democratic challenger Val Deming. Shaq, always great to have you with us. Thanks for being up early. So this debate had its fair share of tense moments, criticisms thrown back and forth between the two candidates. Walk us through some of the more contentious exchanges here. Good morning, Savannah. And yes, it was a very dramatic one. It was the first and only meeting between Senator Marco Rubio and Congresswoman Val Demings. And we got our fair share of insults. There were interruptions. There were dramatic moments that both candidates had up on the debate stage. But one thing that was abundantly clear was the clear contrast between these two candidates, whether you're talking about issues like the economy and inflation, or if you're talking about things like education or abortion. But one of the more dramatic moments that we saw on stage. One of the more contentious moments was after Marco Rubio was asked about a reversal for his position on gun control. It was back in 2018 after the Parkland shooting where he supported raising the minimum age to buy an assault weapon. He said he no longer supports that, says that policy wouldn't work. And that then led to this moment. This is about taking dangerous guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And the overwhelming majority of people in our nation want us to do just that. How long will you watch people being gunned down in first grade, fourth grade, high school, college, church, synagogue, a grocery store, a movie theater, a mall, and a nightclub, Congresswoman, and do nothing? Well, everything she's for would have done nothing to stop any of these shootings. Every one of these shooters would have passed the background check that she keeps insisting on. No one here is in favor of, of mass shootings and violence. I'll tell you, that was the moment that Val Demings and her campaign tweeted out almost immediately. It got millions of views in just the past or the first few hours after the debate. So it's definitely one that they believe was a strong moment for the congresswoman. Absolutely. Shaq, another issue we are seeing at play here from the president on down is, of course, abortion. I'm wondering if you could tell us about what happened there when that came up in the debate. It's an issue we've seen come up in campaigns across the country. Tell us about the positions each of them took last night. Yeah, it was another clear contrast between the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate in this race. And I think the common thread that you heard from them is they were calling the other extreme on this issue for different reasons. Listen to this moment. The extremist on abortion in this campaign is Congresswoman Demings. She supports no restrictions, no limitations of any kind. She voted against a four month, she's against a four month ban. She voted against a five month ban. She supports taxpayer-funded abortion on demand for any reason at any time up until the moment of birth. That's what she supports. That's the extreme position here. Senator, how gullible do you really think Florida voters are? Number one, you have been clear that you s support no exceptions, even including rape and incest. Now, as a police detective who investigated cases of rape and incest, no, Senator, I don't think it's okay for a 10-year-old girl to be raped and have to carry the seed of her rapist. No, I don't think it's okay for you to make decisions for women and girls. As a senator, I think those decisions are made between the woman, her family, her doctor, and her faith. You know, the thing about the exchanges that we saw on the debate stage yesterday is that many of those attacks were telegraphed for the past couple of months. Mm -hmm. If you watch television here in Florida, you saw these campaign ads, you knew many of these lines of attacks were coming, but this was the first an opportunity that either candidate had the chance to respond to those attacks directly and forcefully, and Savannah, they did not hold back. Yeah, absolutely. Shaq, so now we know Demings is trailing Rubio by almost five points. That's according to the Real Clear Politics average. Is there any indication or performance last night would resonate with voters? Close that gap. 
Well, it's a little early to get any indication to answer that question, but I mean, this is a debate that was televised across the state. You had all major media markets in this state, from Orlando to Tallahassee to Miami to Fort Myers, uh, picking up and airing this debate. So there's a chance that this did uh, have a, a, big, a bigger audience than any of these candidates would have had outside of this. But you mentioned this is an increasingly conservative state. That's Florida. Democrats have not won statewide in some time for those top level offices specifically governor, specifically senator. So there is an uphill battle for Democrats. But this is a race that has been tighter than many people suspected. The uh, margin is closer when you look at the average of polling. And there's been an influx of money. We've seen Congresswoman mm -hmm. Demings outraise Rubio for the majority of this race. So there could be a jump ball, but that will remain to be seen. Early voting here in Florida begins next Monday. All right, Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. A record number of black women are running for national office in this year's midterms, and many stand to make history. NBC News Washington correspondent Amy Shelsindor joins us with more on this. Yamish, good morning. Good morning, Joe. There are so few black women serving in elected office across this country, but a record number of them are trying to change that by running for office in this year's midterm elections. I spoke to a number of black women candidates about their experiences. Take a listen. We're doing what we've always done for this nation, and that's rise up to make a difference. We are enduring, and we can get through anything, and we can do anything. Black women have always been capable of leading. They are black women chasing history. A record number of candidates this year hoping to shatter double-pane glass ceilings and overcome challenges related to race and gender. In Florida, Democrat Val Demings, if elected, would be just the third black woman senator. There are currently no black women serving in the U.S. Senate. What's the significance of that? It should reflect the diversity of America. When we think about the talent, the skills, the strength of black women, we bring not only diversity in terms of her ethnic background, but we bring a diversity of perspectives and experiences. She's in an uphill battle to defeat Republican Senator Marco Rubio. Are you guys ready to win in November? And argues she would work to protect abortion rights, provide adequate policing for communities, and make investments in education. We need to hold America to its promise in addressing some of the social ills that cause decay in communities in the first place. Black women make up a small number of elected officials. Vice President Kamala Harris, the highest ranking. The duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. But now a historic number of them are running for national office. 56 women seeking House seats, four running for U.S. Senate, and three running for governor. Among them, Democrats Stacey Abrams in Georgia and Deidre Jajir in Iowa, both facing tough odds to become the first black woman elected governor. And black women are often called the, the, the heart of the Democratic Party. What do you want to see in their roles in terms of change, in terms of more support when it comes to running for office? What I would like for people to consider when they're trying to support communities of color and black women in running for office is that this is not a bet. This is a commitment. And while the majority of black women running are Democrats, there has been an increase in diversity in the Republican Party, too. GOP candidate Tamika Hamilton, who is running for Congress in Sacramento, California, is thinking about all of the people who blazed the trail for her and others. I am a candidate for the presidency of the United States. You know, our ancestors did not go through what they went through for us to give up. What's your message to black women who may be watching this saying, I'm, I'm inspired, but I'm also nervous? Keep going. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Don't let your fears try to tell you you can't do it. Don't stop. There you have it, black women trying to break down barriers, Joe. You should talk to us about some of the unique challenges that black women face when running for office. Well, black women really do have this double pane glass ceiling. They face twin challenges related to race and gender. First, of course, in this country, you have to have a lot of financial support and a lot of backing in order to be successful when you're running for office. And a number of these women told me that they really do face, at times, low expectations and doubts, both from voters but also from donors, that they need to really give them the financial backing to be able to be successful, given that it takes millions and millions of dollars. The other thing that I've heard is that they really face racially charged and at 
times they say racist attack ads. Think about Vice President Kamala Harris. When she was running for president and when she was chosen to be vice president, there were people who were questioning whether or not she was eligible to run for office. And that, of course, was related to the fact that she's an African-American woman, but that she has Jamaican and Indian ancestry. She's a U.S. citizen. But that was really birthed in 2.0. We talk a lot about former President Obama and people questioning his birthplace. But Kamala Harris also faced those same racist attacks. The other thing I heard was that in, Kim, that in Iowa, Kim Reynolds, the governor who's running against Deidre Jajir, she is running as featuring Cori Bush, who is an African-American woman who's serving in Congress, talking about defunding the police. Now, she is running that ad while attacking another black woman, Deidre Jajir. So there are people saying, well, why is Kim Reynolds running a campaign and running an ad, really, about one black woman while attacking her opponent, who happens to also be another black woman? So a lot of questions there, a lot of criticism for that attack. So really, black women to face a lot of challenges, unique, as you said, um, but they're all told me that they are pushing forward, and this is really a movement of black women, Joe. All right, Yamish, thank you so much for that report. Appreciate it. And for more election coverage, be sure to tune in to Meet the Press now this afternoon. Our own Chuck Todd will be live in Georgia talking to voters, local leaders, reporters, and, of course, the candidates. And turning now to the war in Ukraine, Russian-installed officials in Kherson say they're bracing for a major Ukrainian offensive. The Kremlin-backed deputy administrator said, quote, the battle for Kherson will begin in the very near future. Now, at the same time, the new commander in charge of Russia's army in Ukraine said the situation in that region was, quote, tense and difficult. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry joins us now from Kiev with more on this. Hi, Cal. So pro-Russian officials there in Kherson are clearly concerned about this looming battle with Ukrainian forces. We also know they've been evacuating civilians there. Tell us what we've heard from Kiev about this possible major offensive. Are they confident they're going to be able to regain, retake territory? They have said from the beginning that this is a major point for them. This city is a major focus. They want to retake the city because for morale, they believe it would be hugely important. Fighting has been fierce in the city of Kherson for months. And one of the issues that Ukraine is going to face is as they try to retake this city, how much damage are they doing when they retake it? The Russians have moved to the other side of the river. They're in these entrenched positions. So it's become this artillery barrage, heavy fighting. The other thing that's happening is the Russian forces are moving the civilians out of the area. It's partly because the strategy of this being fairly obvious, it's hard to liberate a town if there's nobody there when you go in. Um, the Ukrainians call that forcible, obviously, moving people. They call it abduction. The Russians call it a humanitarian operation. You get an idea of how each side is, is trying to tell the story, Savannah. Oh, absolutely. Cal, another area where Ukrainian forces appear to be pushing is Zaporizhia. The pro-Russian administration there yeah. says they repelled an attempt by Ukraine to retake the nuclear power plant. Of course, one of the big concerns we've had for months now. What more can you tell us about that region? So this is another focal point because of the energy infrastructure, just like here in Kiev. And we have heard some strikes in just the past sort of five minutes um, that we believe are, are on energy infrastructure targets. There's one there. I don't know if you heard that, mm -hmm. Savannah. Um, the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia is a focal point because what the concern is here on amongst the government is that Russia is going to take the power and divert it back into Russia, that they're going to start choking these Ukrainian cities by first cutting the power, then cutting the heat. It's going to be about 20 degrees colder here tomorrow than it is today. It's starting to get very, very cold here. So Zaporizhia is hugely important for Ukrainian forces as the winter approaches. Cal, you mentioned energy infrastructure. We saw yesterday Russian strikes targeting those energy facilities, as you just mentioned, just heard one now. President Zelensky said 30 percent, in fact, of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed in just the last week or so. What's the situation like today and what does that mean for the availability of power for people there? It's dynamic. As I talk to you right now, we're hearing the booms. We know that the target is energy infrastructure. We've seen these power plants be targeted. Sometimes they're hit. Sometimes the Russians miss. The unfortunate thing is, if they miss, they usually hit civilian targets. You know, mm -hmm. Kiev is like any other city in the world. You have these power substations in, in residential neighborhoods. Some are industrial neighborhoods. Uh, but these drones come in, and they set fire to buildings. Buildings collapse. And I, I have a feeling that that's what's unfolding around me right now as I talk to you, as we hear uh, what seems to be the continuation of these strikes. Absolutely. Cal Perry, please stay safe. Thank you so much for being there for us. Now to a case the Justice Department is calling the first of its kind. A French cement company with facilities all over the United States has pleaded guilty to providing financial support to ISIS and other terror groups. NBC News Justice correspondent Ken Delanian has the details. One of the world's largest corporations admitting it funneled millions of dollars to ISIS. Corporate crime that has reached a new low 
and a very dark place. French cement company Lafarge, which operates plants in dozens of countries and 43 U.S. states, pleading guilty to paying terrorists in Syria between 2013 and 2014 so it could keep a cement plant running as ISIS and other groups fought for control. Payments made at the same time the terror group was capturing and beheading U.S. hostages, including James Foley and Stephen Sotloff. Prosecutors say the company sent ISIS and the al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front more than $10 million, then tried to cover it up. Lafarge made a deal with the devil. Foreign terrorists who pledged to and in fact did harm the United States, its people, and its national security. The company agreeing to pay a settlement of nearly $800 million to the U.S. government. French authorities in 2018 charged eight former Lafarge executives with financing terrorism. The company, now owned by a Swiss firm, said it deeply regretted what happened, adding that the executives involved no longer work there and that none of the conduct involved U.S. employees. In a disturbing twist, court documents show Lafarge was doing business with ISIS and Al-Qaeda at the same time its concrete was being used to build One World Trade Center on the site where terrorists destroyed the Twin Towers in 2001. Back to you. All right, Ken, thank you so much. All right, it is time now for today's forecast. You might need to grab your blanket and bundle up. Yeah, that's true, especially here, too. Michelle, meteorologist <laughs> Michelle Grossman joins us with the forecast and hopefully a board that um, is clicking. It, work, but it might not, be frozen. <laughs> it's just, yeah, that's a good one. Alert. <laughs> not only is it freezing, <laughs> not to you back. I know, Joe. We missed Joe. I was like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we can talk this through. Do you want us to act it out? We can. can you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, Jillian's like, don't really know what to do here. Um, wait, let's talk about the weather because we have a little bit of time. Do no, we can. Right? And I'm like at the tail end of my shift, so I know exactly what's happening. <laughs> All right, we have 103 million people by, uh, impacted by a freeze alert. So taking right, a look outside, look at that. There it's you go. chilly well, outside. We, we have clear skies, we have sunshine, but it's chilly yeah. outside. And we're looking at uh, a lot of people under these freeze alerts. So these freeze alerts are from the Central Plains, the Southern Plains, into the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee Valley to the Southeast, into the Mid-Atlantic, and also the Northeast. So we're looking at temperatures well below freezing for this time of year. And it's feeling like mid-December in spots. So as we go throughout uh, the day here, we're going to see temperatures into the 60s in some spots, but some spots staying in the 40s in the Midwest uh, as we go throughout today. It's going to be cold once again tomorrow. So we're going to be below average tomorrow. And really, the eastern half of the nation is well below average. It's to the west, but we're looking at temperatures well above average into the 70s and 80s. We're going to rebound this weekend into more pleasant temperatures, more temperatures normal for this time of year. But you guys, I don't know. It's cold. I don't yeah. really know what to say without these maps working. But if you want to ask me questions, we can do that. I mean, next hour, we're checking in with Morgan Chesky, who's uh -huh. in Texas, of course, was here yesterday. Yes. And we sent him to cold uh -huh. Texas. I mean, it's like in the 30s there, right? It's in the 30s, yeah. yeah. So we are in Vespa all day. Oh, yeah. in, like, <laughs> Shoveling snow. snow in the EP. They had 10 to 16 inches of yeah. snow. It was heavy, wet snow, like all over the fall foliage. They had power outages. Again, feeling like mid-December there, even though it's mid-October. But even where Morgan, I know, we were teasing him because he's like, you know, it's so yeah. warm here. Yeah, it's you know warm back home, but they're in the 30s and they're not going to go very far from here. Oh, wow! All right, look at that. We're going to get that board yeah. unfrozen <laughs> right next hour. Why isn't this moving? <laughs> yeah, I know. Good before. Good job. Well okay. Oh, look right. at that. Still Thank not a Michelle. support cast. Sure. Michelle. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.